Welcome to the Alibaba Cloud webinar series. My name is Nuruddin Abbas Ali and I will be your host for this webinar. In this particular webinar, we are going to go over some basic concepts related to Alibaba Cloud networking. Networking forms the fundamental fabric of communication for all services in the IT world and the cloud is no exception. Hence, we at Alibaba Cloud decided to run you guys through some of the fundamentals on cloud networking. This will help you better design your networks in Alibaba Cloud environment. This webinar is for anyone who's aiming to work with Alibaba Cloud. I will assume that you have some basic knowledge of networking. Even if you don't, it's all right. However, there might be a few sections where you might feel a little lost. If you have any questions, you can submit them anytime by clicking the question mark on the screen and I will be happy to answer them towards the end of the session. So without further ado, let us begin. To begin with, we are going to talk about why we create computer networks in the first place. Then we will look at the basic elements of a computer network and how they map to cloud networking. We will explore some basic networking components of Alibaba Cloud Network and do a brief demo session on these. Then we will look at some additional components and do a couple of sessions on these components as well. Towards the end, we will talk briefly about some additional exploration areas in the Alibaba Cloud Networking world for you to explore further and for us to cover in upcoming webinars. At the very end, there will be a question and answer session and I will be more than happy to ask, answer any questions that you might have. So let's look at why do we network? The reasons behind computer networking are very simple. We network fundamentally to connect people across the world with each other. For example, using uh, services like Skype and instant messaging, etc. Or to connect people to services such as email, online banking, taxi services such as Uber and so on and so forth. Uh, and towards the end, we'll see that sometimes we use networking to connect services to other services. What I mean by that is let's say you have a web server that's trying to access a database server. So that's a service trying to connect to a service or your computer trying to access DHCP or DNS services on the network. When you look at any end user service, usually it will be a combination of two or more of these scenarios. Now let's look at the elements of a basic computer network. At the core of a basic computer network is a router. The basic function of the router is to direct traffic between different networks, may it be traffic coming in and going out of the internet or traffic that is flowing between different internal segments. For simplicity's sake, let's assume that a network segment is represented by a subnet. So when we are trying to make subnets to talk to each other, the traffic needs to go through the router. The next layer is our switches. Each switch is responsible for moving traffic between servers within the same network segment. If however, a server in one network segment needs to talk to a server in another network segment, such traffic needs to go through the router. The router has the particular locations for each of the switches and the respective subnets and is able to route traffic to the correct switch and then eventually to the correct server intended. Going further, we see as we discussed that we have our servers connected to the switches and these are primarily used to host certain services or applications. As we discussed earlier, the internet is usually connected to our basic network via the core router in the network. Of course, there are firewalls in place that can be used to decide what kind of traffic flows between internal network segments and between the internet and your basic network. There are a number of other networking services and other networking devices 
uh, that can be discussed but that's beyond the scope of this webinar and I think this uh, the amount of knowledge that we have discussed today would suffice for we, what we want to describe within the cloud networking world. So when we get into the Alibaba cloud network, the first element that we need to discuss is called a virtual private cloud. When you launch services in Alibaba cloud, you land up in what we call a VPC or virtual private cloud for short. A VPC is a logical isolation. It can represent a company, a department, a division, or whatever logical separation your organization wants to set up. You can launch a number of cloud services inside the VPC. Some of these services like VPN and servers have the capability to communicate to the outside world using public IPs, and we will discuss this in detail shortly. Each user can create multiple VPCs, however note that they are isolated and elements inside one VPC cannot talk to elements inside another VPC using private networks. You can use VPN and dedicated connections to connect two VPCs in same or different regions or a customer environment to Alibaba Cloud VPC. When you launch a VPC-based service in Alibaba Cloud with the default VPC, you get a router and a switch. Note that you can have only one router in any VPC. However, you can have multiple switches. Each switch represents a particular subnet within the VPC. So let's say in the example shown, the network block that we selected for our VPC was 172.16.0.0 slash 16. Now, this block can be further subdivided into subnets. In our example, we have two switches and each represent a different subnet. If you look at the diagram, there are two subnets that are visible 172.16.50 slash 24 and 172.16.10 slash 24 that are both within the slash 16 block provided by the VPC. If you're feeling a little lost with how these segments are created and what does slash 16 mean and what does slash 24 mean, then I would suggest Googling the topic of subnetting. In Alibaba Cloud, when you launch cloud instances, they are known as Elastic Compute Service Instances or ECS instances for short. As can be seen, when you launch an ECS, it gets attached to a switch within the VPC. Depending on which switch it gets attached to, the instance will get a private IP from the respective subnet. In our example, we have two switches, and if you look at the top switch, its subnet is 172.16.5.0/24, and this ECS instance is connected have taken IP from the 172.16.5 subnet. If let's say two instances in the same subnet need to communicate, then the traffic is routed through the switch. However, if the instance needs to communicate to an instance in another switch, then this traffic needs to go through the router. The router maintains a routing table which contains information for all subnets and for, for the respective switches. These are maintained automatically and manual routes can be added to the router. This is a topic that we will touch upon later. So now let's quickly touch the topic of internet-based services. Let's say you wanted to offer a service on your ECS instance to the world at large via the internet. Now remember that we discussed that even though the VPC is a logically isolated environment, elements launched inside a VPC can communicate with the outside world. And that's where public or elastic IPs come in. All a public IP is in the Alibaba cloud world is an added IP that is mapped to the private IP of your ECS instance. Now, what does this mean? This means that if someone on the internet accessed, let's say, 47.23.55.61, which we have assumed as the public IP for our instance, and is shown in orange in the diagram, 
then the traffic would be directed to Alibaba Cloud. And within Alibaba Cloud, the ECS instance with the IP 172.16.5.20. So if you were to launch a website on this ECS instance, then this would be accessible from the outside world. There is also one other kind of public IP in Alibaba Cloud called Elastic IP. It has all the properties of a public IP with the added advantage that it can be moved from one ECS instance to the other. The public IP that we talked about earlier is fixed to the ECS instance and cannot be detached from it. So let's say you had a public IP on an ECS instance. If you decommission that instance, the IP would disappear. However, if you had an elastic IP, you could detach it from this instance and attach it to a new instance. An important part of Alibaba Cloud Network is called security groups. So what do security groups do? These can be used to define allow and deny rules for communications with our cloud instances in Alibaba Cloud. The default security group in Alibaba Cloud allows ICMP, SSH, in RDP access to ECS instances. All other incoming access is blocked. All outgoing access is open by default on all ports. If you have ECS instances that share the same security requirements, you can bundle them together in a sing single security group. Let's say, for example, you had a few web servers where you can want it to open port 80 and port 443, depending on if it's HTTP or HTTPS. So you could set up a security group with incoming traffic allowed on these ports and then apply this to your group of ECS instances. Security groups can also be used to create logical security domains. So let's say you wanted to block all ICMP traffic on your database servers. So what you would do is you would create a new security group and you would create a rule to deny ICMP traffic. And then you can add all your database servers to this security group. So any ICMP traffic that is directed towards these servers will be blocked by the, this particular security group. There's one more thing that you need to understand about security groups and how they affect the public and private IPs alike. What you have to understand about public IPs in Alibaba Cloud is that they are nothing but natted IPs to the private interfaces. Hence, in this example where we allowed port 80 on our set of web servers, this port 80 would also be accessible from the internet or the outside world, so as to say. All right, so now let's look at our first demonstration. Okay, for the first demo, we're going to go through the steps of creating a VPC, creating a couple of switches and assigning uh, a couple of machines to these switches, uh, looking at the security group rules, how they are created, and then see how security group rules can impact the uh, traffic across uh, instances uh, within these switches. All right, so the first step is to create the VPC. So what you see in front of you is the Alibaba Cloud Console. We'll go to Virtual Private Cloud. Here we will go to the VPC section and let's say we are going to select Singapore as our region. So let's say we are going to select a US West Silicon Valley as our selected region. Now 
do note that an uh, existing VPC is there. This is created by default uh, for every single region that we have in Alibaba Cloud. But for completion's sake, we'll create one of our own. So let's create a new VPC. We will call it Webinar VPC1. We will use the same for the description and we will use the CIDR block as 192.16.00 slash 16. So this is the block uh, which will be further distributed into subnets when we create switches. Now the moment you press create a VPC, it says your VPC has been created and do you want to take the next steps. So there it asks you to create a vSwitch. Now we will call this one webinar v switch one select zone. All right. So we since we are in a region with multiple zones, we have to select which zone this switch resides in. So we'll select zone A. So why we will call it one nine two one six eight dot one dot zero slash twenty four. As we discussed earlier, if subnets are confusing to you, just go over the topic of subnetting on your favorite networking website or just Google subnetting and it should be very simple to understand. Uh, we'll leave the description blank. As you see, the block that we've selected is going to allow us 252 IPs within this particular network. So we create the V switch and we done. All right, so let's look at the webinar VPC that we just created. If you go inside this VPC, what you see is the details of the CIDR block and you see the V switch that we just created. One more thing you gotta notice is V routers. And notice that a, a V router has automatically been added. So as we discussed earlier, there can only be one V router for every VPC and you cannot add more. However, you can add multiple switches. As you can see, our routes have been automatically added for the switches that are defined. Now, what we're going to do is we create another V switch. We will call this webinar V switch 2. Again, we'll put it in zone A and we'll select 5.0 slash 24 as the subnet, just to be different. And we'll say OK. And OK. So, as you can see, we've got two. V switches. One is of subnet 192.168.1.0 and the other one is 192.168.5.0. Now what we will do is we'll quickly launch a couple of instances in these V switches and see how different subnets impact the instances that are launched. So what we'll do is we'll create ECS instance. This takes us to a new window. You select pay as you go and we will select silicon valley zone a remember that this is the region we have created our switches in so we'll select select a small linux machine for this we'll select our webinar vpc and for this one we'll select webinar v switch one security group there is always a secure default security group that we'll select and then we'll go through the security group later now, as you can see, the security group is allowing ICMP port 22 and 3389, and it's asking us if we want to open port 80 and 443. So let's just, just for the sake of understanding, we'll open these ports as well. We'll select a simple Ubuntu machine. Uh, we'll leave the default storage. We'll set the password so that we can log into it quickly. Oops. Uh, uh, however, in a production environment, I would suggest that you use SSH keys instead of passwords. 
and we say buy now all right and activate and there we go so on the console you can see our instance should be launching so we go to instances and we can see our instance being launched so now while this is being launched let's launch another instance now this time we'll connect it to the second switch so we'll select pay as you go again we will go in silicon valley we'll select zone a small machine webinar vpc however we switch to for security group you'll select the same security group as before then we will select a ubuntu machine default storage set the password just for the ease of use and buy now and activate now we'll go to the console and we'll start playing around with the machines all right so let's look at our instances okay so we've got two instances uh, that have been launched uh, in uh, us west which is silicon valley uh, zone a so let's try to connect to these instances so okay so you will notice that an internet IP or a public IP has been assigned to this instance by default. Now let's try to SSH into this instance and see if it's gonna allow us to do so. So I'm gonna go here and I'm gonna say SSH root at yeah. and surely it does allow us SSH. We put in our password and we are in. All right. So now something that I want you to notice. First of all, let's look at the IP that is assigned, private IP that is assigned to this instance. This is 192.168.1.198. And if you look at the second instance, it's on the 5 subnet 192.168.5.87. This is only because both of them are sitting on two different V switches. Now let's look at if config and surely you can see the IP that we were talking about 192.168.1.198. Now let's try to ping our instance on the other subnet and see if we can. So we do a ping we do this this is the final and surely we can now remember that this is only possible because we have a router in between which has the routes for the particular switches all right so there are two things that I would like to show you across these uh, machines so the first thing that I would like to go through would be the security groups so we selected one of these security groups. Ah, this one. Let's because it's got two instances. So let's look at the rules. All right. So since we were able to SSH, we should have allowed port 22 incoming traffic, which is surely allowed here. Also, we are able to ping across them, which means ICMP must be allowed which is also allowed here now let's say if i were to delete the icmp rule and it's gone okay so now what i'm going to do is i'm going to try and ping one of these instances from outside which means from the internet and see if i'm still able to ping them so i will take one of the public IPs let's take this one and I'm going to go to my command line 
I will open a new tab and this is I am outside the Alibaba cloud network and I run a ping to this IP and as you can see I am unable to ping this chain all right so now let's go back to the security group and we go to configure rules and we add the ICMP rule back so let's add the ICMP rule back 0, 0, 0, 0, slide 0 all right so we've allowed ICMP traffic from all networks and we say okay and that's done and now if we go here and try to ping the same machine we should be able to ping it so that tells you how security groups allow us to protect our machines from uh, opening and closing of ports and exposing services out to the outside world all right so that's it uh, now let's get back to the webinar All right, so that's it for this demo. Uh, let's get back to the slides. The next component that we are going to discuss is the server load balancer or SLB for short. Honestly, uh, SLB is a very detailed service and it warrants a webinar on its own. However, since this is an introductory session, I will go over some prominent details of the service. If you get a good response on this, maybe we can do a detailed webinar just for SLB in the future. So, there are two kinds of SLB in Alibaba Cloud, namely the SLB for TCP traffic and SLB for HTTP or HTTPS traffic. In addition to standard load balancing capabilities, TCP and HTTP SLBs can defend DDoS attacks enhancing the protection capability of application servers. The SLB can be launched in two modes, namely internet and intranet. Uh, what this means is uh, you can have a load balancer that is internet facing and accessible from the outside world, or you could have uh, load balancers between different layers of your servers, let's say, you could have a load balancer for your database layer that your web server layer can connect to. Now this would be an intranet based SLB and would be free of cost. The internet facing SLB however is a charged service. You can put your ECS instances behind SLBs to avoid single point of failure situations and with the help of SLB, you can do load balancing, health monitoring, and auto scaling. All right, now let's look at some of the features of the server load balancer. Alibaba Cloud provides both layer four, which is TCP and UDP, and layer seven, HTTP and HTTPS load balancing services. This allows customers to load balance their traffic easily across different ECS instances. Load balancers also maintain a health check on backend servers. There are multiple levels of health checks that are performed including cluster level statuses, TCP connections, UDP connections, and HTTP, HTTPS requests. Now that this really depends on what kind of load balancer you've set up and the health check will vary accordingly. And there are certain parameters of the health check that can be tweaked in order to cater for your needs. If a backend server becomes unhealthy, the SLB stops distributing application requests to the server and it is removed from the backend servers until the issue is resolved. So this is how the health check functionality of SLB ensures uh, that you are always being served by a healthy set of backend servers. 
One more feature supported by server load balancer is session persistence. You can set listening rules to forward session requests from one client to the same backend ECS instance during session lifecycle. What this essentially means is that in case you wanted to maintain sessions for an application on your ECS servers and wanted the client to be served by the same ECS while the session was active, then the SLB can take care of this as well. Server load balancer supports a number of distribution algorithms. Now, distribution algorithms are basically algorithms that are used to decide where the particular packet would go to within the SLB cluster. So the simplest one to begin with is the, called the round robin. As the name suggests, the round robin algorithm distributes requests to servers in a sequence and then circles back to the first one. So let's say you had three ECS instances in a load balancing cluster then the first request would go to the first one, the second request to the second one, the third request to the third one, and then for the fourth request would go back to the first ECS instance. The second algorithm is weighted round robin, WRR for short, where in addition to the sequential distribution, you can assign weights to the backend servers. So, the highly weighted servers will receive more requests and the lowly weighted servers will get less requests in a loop cycle. Now let me try to explain this. Let's say you have two ECS instances behind a load balancer. One ECS instance has weight 100 and the other ECS instance has a weight of 50. So let's look at how the requests will be distributed. So the first request will go to the first ECS instance, which is marked as 100. The second request will also go to this ECS instance, marked as 100. The third request would go to the second ECS instance, which is marked with a weight of 50. And then this loop would go back to ECS1. The last one uh, is uh, called weighted lease connections, which follows the same concept of weights, but it does not do a round robin. While considering weights, it looks at the server which has the least number of connections and then distributes the requests to this particular server. For layer seven HTTP and HTTPS protocols, server load balancer forwards traffic to different vServer groups, which are nothing but different groups of backend servers. Now, well, let me try to explain this a little better. So let's say you had a server load balancer in front of a set of ECS servers, and you wanted to use the same load balancer to let's say load balance two different applications. Now these two different applications, let's assume, are running on two groups, two different groups of ECS servers. So what you would do is you would create what we call vServer groups for each of these ECS server groups. And then you would create rules to redirect traffic based on the domain name of the application. So any draft packets directed to let's say domain for a uh, domain name for application A would be directed to the vServer group one and any traffic that is directed towards application B would be sent to the ECS group B. B. Now, the SLB can also be launched in a high availability setup. So let's say if you are in a multi-zone environment in Alibaba Cloud, then you could launch uh, your SLB in an HA environment. Please note that Alibaba Cloud terms a zone is representing an independent data center. 
So let's say you launched an application in a multi-zone environment as we are shown in the screen. So your primary SLB sits in one zone and is able to serve backend application servers from both zones. Now for any reason your first zone becomes unavailable, then the SLB in the backup zone will take over and your service to your customers will continue to function as before. This allows for zonal level resilience on your applications. Now let's look at a quick demo for server load balancer. In the interest of time, what I have done is I've already pre-created a load balancer. I've connected it to two ECS instances. Now these ECS instances are both running a web server I modified the default HTML file for each of these web servers so that we can differentiate between the two. All right, so uh, the idea of this session is to just run you through a few options that you have available in the surf server load balancer and uh, to make you see it in action. All right, so let's, let's go through the details. So on the console, if you go through the server load balancer, this is the one that I've created in US West. It is an internet facing load balancer since it's ha it has a public IP. So let's, let's dig deeper into this. So in the load balancer, the first and foremost thing that you need to understand is the concept of listeners. So what listeners do is they allow the load balancer to listen on a particular port right and then redirect this traffic to the same or a different set port on its backend servers so we already have a listener defined let's look at a few things and try to recall what we went through uh, during the slides so let's look at a few options as you can see that this listener listens on port 80 and then it sends traffic to the backend servers on port 80 as well uh, our scheduling algorithm, I told you there were three of them. We have selected weighted round robin. And this is the vServer group option which we discussed we would use in case we were using one load balancer to load balance more than one application. These are a few other options. Remember we talked about session persistence which is available here and a few other compression options and HTTP header options are available. Next, we've uh, talked about health checks uh, and how SLB is able to maintain health check on multiple levels. And uh, these are different options that you can set for health check interval and thresholds for that matter. For now, we will disable the health check uh, for the demo purpose and we just leave it here okay now the next thing you need to look at is backend servers uh, we've added two servers to the backend and let me just change this to 100 confirm I'm just making sure they are all weighted equally so they're both weighted equally you have two servers at the backend running now let's look at this load balancer in action. So let's get the public IP of the load balancer and let's try to access it from the internet. So as you can see, it is saying welcome to Nginx2. It's in a standard Nginx image. I've just made a small change. So it says two here. Now, if you start refreshing this, you see this change is to one. So this is the small change I've made so we can differentiate which ECS server is responding to the request from the SLB. So now if you keep refreshing this, this keeps going from one to two to one to two. Now this is because inside our listener, our forwarding rule is weighted round robin. And if you go to the backend servers, your weight is defined as being equal. 
Now let's try to mess around with the weights a little bit. So let's say I make the weight 50 for one of them. So let's confirm this to 50. All right, so now according to what we discussed, since this is 100 and this one's 50, when I start throwing requests at the SLB, two requests should be published, should be, sorry, answered by the, this particular server and then one should be forwarded here. So two here, one here, then two here, then one here. Let's try to test this theory. All right, so let's try to first access this and we're at one. I refresh one more time, it goes to two then one, then one again, then two, one, one, and two. All right, so, and if you keep going, what you would realize is that two requests are going to server one, and then one request is going to server two. Because server two is set to wait 50, and this is set to weight 100. So you could use the weights to decide how you want to distribute the particular load for a load balancer. I mean, this is a very quick uh, overview of how load balancers work. As I said uh, during uh, the presentation of the slides, uh, the server load balancer is a huge topic and it deserves a, a webinar of its own. Maybe in the future we can go through a detailed demo of how to configure a load balancer and how to look at all the various options that are available. Uh, but I think that will be too much for the introductory session. So uh, this is it for this demo. Now let's get back to the slides. Now let's look at the last item on the list, which is VPN Gateway. As we discussed earlier, Alibaba Cloud VPC is an isolated environment. Of the many ways to establish communications with the outside world, one of the most commonly used ways is to leverage a VPN Gateway. You can use a VPN Gateway in a number of scenarios. Let's look at a few of them. Let's say you wanted to connect a VPC to another VPC in the same region. Yes, do remember VPCs are completely isolated even when they reside in the same region. If you are, let's say you want to connect a VPC to another VPC in a different region. Uh, the third scenario talks about connecting your VPC to a customer data center. Let's say he has some on-premise servers that need to connect uh, into the public cloud or let's say for a hybrid in cloud model or let last but not the least connecting the VPC to another public cloud. In order to understand the VPN gateway well, let's look at an example with two VPCs and how you would go about connecting them using a VPN gateway. Now in this example I've used two VPCs but effectively the same steps could be used to connect any two sites as long as one end is talking about the Alibaba cloud. So in order to form a connection between the two VPCs so that the instances one VPC can talk to instances in, a, in the other VPC on the private IP. So, so the idea is that the two, the ECS instances in the two VPCs can talk to each other without you having to be able to assign you know, public IPs to these instances and the communication should be private and secure. We, for this, we will follow what a five-step process. First, we configure a VPN gateway in VPC1. Now, this can be done as the Alibaba Cloud VPN gateway, which is a service provided by Alibaba Cloud, or you could use any VPN gateway from the Alibaba Cloud Marketplace. Now we do the same configuration on a VPN, new VPN gateway in VPC2. You have to note that when configuring the VPN, there are a number of settings that you need to take care of. Normally, when you're connecting 
two sites, you would use an IPsec VPN. Now, when you configure the VPN on both sides, ensure that the security settings on both sides match. Otherwise, you will not be able to establish a successful connection. Next, what do you do? You make the connection and ensure that the tunnel is up. Once this is done, you ensure that the traffic for the respective private network is allowed via the tunnel. What this means is that for certain VPN gateway configurations, you might have to explicitly allow traffic for certain subnets on both sides. And finally, what do you do? You have to add routes to the router to ensure that the VPN traffic is routed through the VPN gateway. There are a few things that I would like you to note. The above steps might not be in the same order depending on which VPN gateway you're using. For example, the configuration to allow traffic on the tunnels, which is step four as far as we are concerned, can sometimes be part of VPN gateway configuration, which is step two. And remember, this is just an example. You would more or less use the same step to create any VPN tunnel across any two environments. The specifics will, however, vary. The general gist remains the same. All right. So on this slide, I've put down a list of some services that we can further explore in the future. The first one is the Cloud DNS service, which is a service that you can use for domain name resolution services. The second is called CDN or Content Delivery Network. Now this allows customers to accelerate their services globally using a combination of caching and acceleration methodologies. The third one is WAF, which is Web Application Firewall that can help customers protect their web applications against malicious attacks. Express Connect is also an Alibaba cloud service and it is a convenient and efficient way that allows a fast, stable, secure, and private or dedicated network communication between different cloud environments, including VPC, intranet communications, and dedicated lease line connections across regions and users. Whoa, that, that was long. And finally, anti-DDoS, which allows customers to protect their services against globally distributed denial of service attacks. You can find all the information for these services on our cloud documentation portal on the Alibaba Cloud website. Also, we might be able to cover some of them in the webinars in the future. So folks, that's it from me for the day. Let me see if there are any questions that have been raised and I will try my best to answer them to the best of my knowledge. Okay, folks, so it looks like we have a couple of questions today. So the first question that came in was, uh, does the public IP change if you power off an instance? Uh, the quick answer is no, it does not. If you power off an instance and then power it back on, the public IP remains the same. If, however, you release the instance, then you will lose the public IP along with the instance. Uh, the second question I received uh, was from Arnold and he asked, will we be able to download this webinar for future reference? The answer is yes, the webinar will be made available on the Alibaba Cloud website within 24 hours uh, of this session. Uh, you can view it uh, at any time for future re reference, however, you will not be able to download it. Uh, as a, a third question has come in uh, as asking if we can leverage Alibaba cloud networking when it comes to integrating uh, with multi-cloud systems. Uh, let's say if a customer, the, the specific question is with regards to if a customer has machines deployed on another cloud. So the answer is yes, uh, when it comes to Alibaba cloud, uh, you can connect to your uh, Alibaba Cloud uh, VPC using several technologies that we discussed today. 
A uh, couple of them to mention would be VPN, Express Connect, and also you could uh, do a dedicated lease line into the Alibaba Cloud uh, setup. All right, so I just received one more question. Uh, they are uh, somebody's asking if we will put this up on YouTube as well. Uh, yes, I just confirmed this and we will put it on YouTube as well. So let me just confirm if there are any more questions or not before I conclude today's session. Ah, somebody sent a comment saying thank you for the session. It was very informative. Thank you very much for uh, tuning in. Uh, really appreciate it. All right, so we've uh, received a question on install on VMware. If you need to install VMware for installing network equipment, uh, no, everything that runs in Alibaba Cloud uh, runs on what we call the AppSera stack, and there's no need to install any uh, VMware networking equipment in this case. There is also a question on config. How do we go about configuring VPCs? Uh, if you were to go uh, back to this uh, a recording of this session, uh, you would uh, what you uh, you would realize that in the beginning, in the first demo, we did configure one VPC. So all you would do is select a couple of regions and uh, use the first demonstration to deploy uh, a couple of VPCs. Uh, the configuration steps for VPN is something that. Uh, is a little more elaborate for me to verbally explain however what I can do is I can uh, check with the team and if this can be published uh, as part uh, of the YouTube or or the question and answers on the website okay I think that's it for today thank you to everyone who joined us uh, as I said before a recording of this session will be available on the Alibaba cloud website for anyone who wants to refer to it in the future once again, thank you and have a very nice day ahead.